Congratulations, you're part of the 1%. That is, the 1% of species on Earth not yet extinct. Over the past 3.5 billion years, around 99% of the estimated 4 billion species that ever lived are gone. Extinction isn't some rare fluke, it's the rule. Many evolutionary family trees got the axe, so to speak, during mass extinctions. These events wipe out at least 75% of species in the geological blink of an eye, whether that means a few thousand years or a few million. Thanks to the fossil record, researchers have traced five major mass extinctions over the last half a billion years, and many scientists believe we're smack in the middle of a sixth one. Extinction is just evolution's way of clearing the board. Every species that shows up eventually has to check out. It's just how nature rolls. Sometimes it's a slow fade, where one species gradually morphs into another, barely leaving a gap. Other times, it's a brutal game of survival, where one species just can't keep up. Maybe it reproduces too slowly, or just isn't as good at grabbing food as the competition. And then, there's the ultimate wrecking ball, an outsider species rolling in and throwing everything off balance. Whether it drifts in naturally or hitchhikes with humans, a fast-spreading species can muscle out the locals, gobble up resources, or introduce a style of hunting the native animals never saw coming. Islands? They're like extinction hotspots, because their species have nowhere to run when a newcomer crashes the party. But here's a twist. Extinction isn't always about direct competition. Some species are so closely tied to others that when one goes, the other is basically doomed. Think of the gut bacteria that used to live inside a triceratops, or the mites clinging to a T-Rex. When the host disappears, so do the little guys that depended on it. Mass extinctions happen when disasters pile up. Ocean acidification, scorching temperatures, or massive volcanic eruptions blanketing entire regions. While asteroid impacts get a lot of attention, only one has been definitively linked to a mass extinction. Each event slams the brakes on a geologic period, reshaping ecosystems and giving survivors a shot at dominance. Life bounces back, often in unpredictable ways. Long before humans, dinosaurs, or even trees showed up, Earth nearly hit the reset button on life itself. Back in the Ordovician period, around 485 to 444 million years ago, the oceans were buzzing with life. Trilobites and mollusks scuttled along the seafloor, plankton drifted in the currents, and coral reefs flourished. Jawless fish, our distant ancestors, drifted through shallow waters, while some researchers think green algae, with a little help from fungi, may have started creeping onto land. Then, around 445 million years ago, things took a turn for the worse. In a relatively short span of 1.4 million years, 85% of species vanished in what became Earth's first mass extinction, the Late Ordovician Mass Extinction, or LOAM. One leading theory suggests the first wave of extinctions hit when the Ice Age began. Algae and cyanobacteria, the base of the food chain, might not have adapted fast enough to the coal. The second wave likely struck when the ice melted and temperatures soared again, triggering massive algae blooms, similar to the ones we see today when pollution overloads lakes and rivers. These blooms could have drained oxygen from the oceans, turning them into suffocating dead zones, a pattern scientists have found in the geologic record. The exact cause of loam is still up for debate, but the aftermath is crystal clear. Nearly every major group of Ordovician life trilobites, brachiopods, bryozoans, took a hit. But unlike later extinctions which wiped out entire branches of life, some species from almost every major group managed to scrape by. In the Silurian period, which followed, these survivors got back to business, repopulating the seas. Loam may have been Earth's first mass extinction, but it wouldn't be the last. And if history tells us anything, it's that life always finds a way though not every species gets a second chance. The Late Devonian extinction was a prolonged crisis rather than a single event, unfolding in multiple extinction waves over millions of years. The two most significant were the Kelwasser event, around 372 million years ago, and the Hangenberg event, 359 million years ago, 
which marked the end of the Devonian and the start of the Carboniferous. By the time it was over, around 19% of families and 50% of genera had disappeared, dealing a major blow to marine life. Reef builders like corals and stromatoporoids were hit particularly hard, along with brachiopods, trilobites, and jawless fish. By the late Devonian, Earth's land was covered in forests and crawling with insects, while the oceans remained rich with life. But dramatic climate shifts, ice ages, warming periods, and sea level fluctuations threw ecosystems into disarray. Oxygen depletion in the oceans and oxia played a key role, possibly triggered by volcanic activity, global cooling, or even an asteroid impact, such as the Siljan Ring event in Sweden. Some scientists suggest that biodiversity declined not just due to extinctions, but also because widespread species outcompeted specialists, limiting new evolutionary developments. Placoderms, or armored fish, were among the hardest hit, suffering losses in the Kalvasar event before disappearing entirely in the Hungenberg event. Early tetrapods, however, managed to survive and later diversified, though tetrapodomorph fish like Tiktaalik did not. Other marine groups adapted, with trilobites evolving larger respiratory brims to cope with increasing oxygen-poor waters. Geochemical evidence points to a global cooling event, possibly linked to the expansion of land plants, which absorbed CO2 from the atmosphere. The period also saw massive volcanic eruptions, such as those in the Vuloy Large Igneous Province that released greenhouse gases, leading to climate instability, sea level drops, and further ocean anoxia. Some researchers even propose that a nearby supernova could have damaged Earth's ozone layer, exposing life to harmful radiation and contributing to extinction. By the end of the Devonian, marine ecosystems were in ruins, but the species that survived paved the way for the evolutionary radiations of the Carboniferous. Some 252 million years ago, Earth was rocked by the biggest ecological disaster in its history, the Permian-Triassic extinction, better known as the Great Dying. This mass extinction wiped out over 90% of marine species and 70% of terrestrial species, an almost unimaginable loss of life. So, what could have triggered such an epic catastrophe? The Permian period kicked off about 299 million years ago, marking the end of the Paleozoic era. At this time, Earth's land masses had collided to form a single supercontinent, Pangaea, stretching from pole to pole. While that might sound cool, the reality was harsh. The sheer size of Pangaea meant that much of its interior was cut off from coastal moisture, turning vast regions into arid deserts. Life, however, found ways to adapt. Amphibians, which had been dominant in earlier periods, began to struggle as their swampy habitats dried up. Some, like Eriops, a 6-foot or 1.8-meter long predator, hung on for a while, but the shift toward drier conditions favored new kinds of animals. While flowering plants were still millions of years away, conifers, ferns, horsetails, and ginkgo trees thrived, providing food and shelter for evolving herbivores. Reptiles, with their tough, water-resistant skin, were better suited to these new conditions and quickly took over. Insects also experienced a boom, with the first species capable of metamorphosis appearing. Meanwhile, the oceans were teeming with life, coral reefs flourished, marine invertebrates thrived, and a group of mammal-like reptiles called therapsids started making their mark on land. It was a world full of evolutionary potential. So how did such a dynamic world spiral into catastrophe? The evidence points to a deadly combination of extreme climate shifts, oxygen depletion, and rising ocean temperatures. An environmental domino effect that drove most life forms to extinction. Ocean temperatures skyrocketed by about 51 degrees Fahrenheit, 10.5 degrees Celsius, making survival nearly impossible for any marine species. Warmer waters demand more oxygen. But at the same time, oxygen levels in the oceans plummeted, leaving sea life gasping, literally. 
The main suspect behind these climate changes? A relentless volcanic onslaught in the region known as the Siberian Traps. These eruptions lasted for over a million years, belching out massive amounts of greenhouse gases and triggering runaway global warming. But the damage didn't stop there. Acid rain poisoned ecosystems, and ocean acidification wrecked marine food chains. Even worse, methane stored in the ocean likely started leaking out, amplifying the warming in a vicious feedback loop. Scientists have also discovered spikes in mercury levels from this time, which may have been another volcanic side effect. Interestingly, the extinction on land may have started about 300,000 years before the ocean collapse, hinting that other factors, possibly even a weakening ozone layer, played a role in the terrestrial die-off. After the dust settled, Earth was a barren, overheated wasteland. It took millions of years for life to bounce back to pre-extinction levels. But some hardy survivors, like Lystrosaurus, took advantage of the empty niches and flourished. The Permian extinction may have even paved the way for the first dinosaurs to rise a few million years later, reshaping life on Earth forever. Life took a long time to recover after the Permian-Triassic extinction, but once it did, evolution really began to take off. The oceans, which had once lost much of their biodiversity, saw the rise of new reef-building organisms. Unlike the Permian, where rugos and tabulate corals dominated, Triassic reefs were mainly built by sclerotinian corals and hypercalcifying sponges, organisms that adapted to the changing ocean conditions. On land, vegetation made a strong comeback. Conifers, cycads, ginkophytes, and seed ferns grew across vast forests. These new, lush ecosystems provided fresh inhabitants for herbivorous reptiles and insects, which helped create more complex terrestrial food webs. Life on Earth was recovering and diversifying once again. One of the most significant evolutionary developments during the Triassic was the ascent of the Archosaurs, a group of reptiles that would leave an extraordinary legacy. This lineage gave rise to crocodilians, pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and ultimately birds. Initially, crocodilian relatives, pseudosuchians, dominated the land, filling a variety of ecological roles. Some were large terrestrial predators, while others resembled armored herbivores or sleek semi-aquatic hunters. Meanwhile, early dinosaurs remained relatively small and ecologically marginal, overshadowed by their larger, more established reptilian relatives. However, the world was far from stable. About 201 million years ago, as the Triassic period drew to a close, Earth was once again rocked by catastrophe. The Triassic-Jurassic extinction event, which wiped out an estimated 75 to 80 percent of species across land and sea. A major suspect behind this crisis is the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province, or CAMP, a vast volcanic region that formed as Pangaea began to break apart. CAMP is one of the largest known large igneous provinces, or LIPS, with an estimated lava volume exceeding 2.5 million cubic kilometers, enough to cover the entire continental US in a 400 meter thick layer of rock. That's 1,312 feet. Today, remnants of this ancient lava field are scattered across eastern North America, South America, and West Africa, a testament to the colossal geological upheavals of the time. The intense volcanic activity from camp released huge amounts of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and methane into the atmosphere over hundreds of thousands of years, leading to severe consequences. Global temperatures spiked. Earth's average temperature rose by 3 to 6 degrees C, that's 5 to 11 degrees Fahrenheit, due to the quadrupling of CO2 levels, destabilizing ecosystems, and altering weather patterns with droughts and storms. Ocean acidification. CO2 dissolved into seawater, lowering pH levels and making it harder for marine organisms like ammonites, bivalves, and corals to form shells causing significant losses. Marine anoxia. Warmer oceans held less oxygen, creating dead zones 
and further contributing to marine extinctions. Wildfires and vegetation shifts. Increased wildfires and changing climates led to shifts in plant species, with some struggling to adapt to the new conditions. Before the extinction event, crocodilian relatives, pseudosuchians, were the dominant large terrestrial vertebrates. These ranged from heavily armored herbivores to apex predators, some exceeding 5 meters or 16.4 feet in length. However, the Triassic-Jurassic boundary marked a dramatic turnover in terrestrial ecosystems. Most large pseudosuchians perished, leaving only a few survivors, which later evolved into modern crocodilians. This extinction event cleared the way for the dinosaurs, previously overshadowed by larger competitors, small theropods and early sauropodomorphs suddenly found themselves in a world with fewer rivals. Over the next few million years, dinosaurs diversified rapidly, radiating into an array of ecological niches. By the mid-Jurassic, they had become the dominant vertebrates on land, a reign that would last for the next 135 million years. The Triassic-Jurassic extinction event was a pivotal moment in Earth's history. It reshaped ecosystems, allowed dinosaurs to rise to dominance, and set the stage for the Jurassic period's evolutionary explosion. Without it, the Mesozoic world might have looked entirely different, perhaps with crocodilian relatives still ruling the land, while dinosaurs remained small and ecologically marginal. In 1980, physicist Luis Walter Alvarez and his geologist son threw out a game-changing theory. An asteroid impact caused the mass extinction of the dinosaurs. They pointed to a layer of iridium-rich clay as evidence of the collision and argued that the asteroid's immediate devastation, plus all the chaos that followed, was why the dinosaurs disappeared so suddenly. Asteroids are big, rocky bodies zipping around the sun and when they crash into Earth, they're called meteorites. The Alvarez theory was a tough sell at first, but now it's pretty much the go-to explanation, especially with the Chicxulub crater off Mexico's coast matching the extinction's timing. The asteroid was about 10 to 15 kilometers, or 6.2 to 9.3 miles wide, and the impact created a massive crater, 150 kilometers, or 93 miles across. It threw tons of debris into the air, blocking sunlight and messing with plant life, which set off a chain reaction through the food chain. Herbivores and carnivores alike struggled to find food, and Earth's conditions turned brutal for pretty much all life. But the asteroid wasn't the only player in the game. Earth was also dealing with volcanic eruptions, especially in India, which pumped gases into the atmosphere, messing with the climate even more. And with continents drifting around, ecosystems were getting a major shakeup. Plants had a better chance of surviving because seeds and pollen can handle harsh conditions. After the dust settled, flowering plants started to take over, and smaller animals made it through, eventually paving the way for mammals. The dinosaurs were gone, but birds, their descendants, hung on and adapted. It took millions of years for the big mammals to show up, and before that, the world was full of smaller creatures. Dinosaurs were still the biggest land animals to ever walk the Earth, with only whales topping them. Some research even suggests that if the asteroid had hit somewhere else or at a different time, the extinction might not have been so catastrophic. <laughs>